Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. When you think about it, every firearm has a story, a history if you will. Wyoming State Museum volunteer Evan Green has spent countless hours updating the inventory of firearms at the State Museum. Next on Wyoming Chronicle, Green presents a history of firearms in Wyoming, featuring selections from the variety of firearms contained in the Wyoming State Museum's permanent collection. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. I'm Craig Blumenshine from Wyoming PBS, and welcome to this special Wyoming Chronicle. We're in the Wyoming State Museum with Evan Green, learning about some of the um, I guess the permanent collection of firearms that Correct, is, yes. is here at the museum, Evan. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get to s some of these incredible stories behind these, these weapons, we, I want to ask you about your history. Um, you're a volunteer here at the museum. Yes, I've been a volunteer here uh, since 2014. And I started just at the welcome desk greeting visitors and talking about the museum. And then a little over a year ago, uh, my supervisor here, Jim Allison, um, asked me if I would be interested in updating the inventory of the museum's permanent collection of firearms. And I said, absolutely, what a, what a wonderful opportunity for me to do that. And I've enjoyed it very much. And how you know an amazing amount about, about these firearms. How did you cultivate that history yourself? I've always been interested in firearms. I was raised on a ranch in eastern Colorado. We had firearms around all the time. I got my first uh, rifle in 1952 when I was eight years old. So I've always been interested in firearms as a hobby. Uh, I've been uh, in the past a hunter. I uh, participated in handgun competitions, including <clears throat> cowboy action shooting. Uh, and I spend a lot of time online. That's my interest on various forums. I have a library of reference books. Again, it's just always been an interest, and I've learned a tremendous amount, not only about the firearms in the collection, but uh, about Wyoming history and how these firearms have contributed to that history. And that's what we want to really talk a lot about today as well. It's not just that this is a certain model made by a certain manufacturer. Right. These guns all have stories. Yes, they do. And before we get into that, that um, tell us, you also have a video um, um, project here with the State Museum where you do this periodically throughout the year. Yeah, every other Friday we post a video on YouTube, a five to ten minute video of me talking about some of the firearms in the permanent collection. So there'll be a lot more that people can look at other than just the, yes. the, the five or six um, guns that we're going to talk about today. And I understand you can link to that uh, we sure will. site. We'll, we'll make sure that you showing have Showing our viewers that right now, as a matter of fact. This is going to be an interesting chronicle for me because I'm just going to sit back and, and listen and learn. I had a chance to see you give this a, a similar lecture here at the museum about a month ago, and that's where we, we met, and um, now I'm back and I want to share this with our viewers. So Great. let's start, if we, if we could. Okay, and as you said, uh, Craig, a lot of it, uh, interest in the firearms is the story behind them. And we're going to start with this uh, carbine. It is a Whitneyville rolling block carbine, and there were about 40 or 50,000 of these in this configuration or a longer rifle configuration made between 1871 and 1881. And uh, Whitney, of course, was the progeny of Eli Whitney, who invented the cotton gin and was also a firearms manufacturer. So again, this is an interesting single shot uh, firearm on the uh, Opposite side here, we have what's called a carbine ring or a saddle ring, and this was used uh, in conjunction with an over-the-shoulder sling, normally by the cavalry to ensure if the horse was shot or they got bucked off, they wouldn't lose their, their firearm. And again, the story behind this has to do with a donor who was William Sturgis. And in 1924, he donated this carbine 
to the museum, which we were, of course, uh, people at the time were very glad to get. And in doing the research on this, I went across the hall to the State Archives and found a letter that Sturgis had written to a friend in Guernsey, Wyoming in uh, about 1925, describing his career as a cattleman in Wyoming. William Sturgis and his brother, Thomas, came to Wyoming in 1873 to cash in on this incredible opportunity of free grass, free water, free range. All you had to do was buy a bunch of cattle, turn them loose, round them up later, and uh, you had a minor investment. Uh, his first herd was 500 longhorn steers, which he grazed for two years, rounded them up, he'd only lost two or three. In 1883, he and his brother and a partner capitalized the Union Cattle Company for $3 million. A lot of money then, equivalent now to $76 million in 2014 currency. So uh, let's move forward to 1886. In the spring of 1886, Sturgis guys and their partner branded 15,000 calves, which brought their total herd estimate to over 70,000 head of stock. 1886 was kind of a drought year, and because of this wonderful opportunity to take advantage of free grass and water, uh, the ranges were overstocked. So the livestock went into the winter of 86, 87 in fairly poor condition anyway, and it was a terrible winter. The next spring, they branded substantially fewer calves, and he estimated, Sturgis estimated in his letter that they had lost 40,000 wow. head of cattle. Wow. While he was in his prime, he built a house on 17th Street here in Cheyenne, which is now on the National Register of Historic Places. But because of the reverses he suffered in that terrible winter, he had to sell his house. And he eventually went back to New York, uh, but would come back uh, uh, once a year to tend to the other businesses that he had here. He was invested in mines. He and his brother were on the board of the first electric company in Cheyenne. <laughs> Uh, he and his brother organized the Wyoming <clears throat> Stock Growers Association, which in those days was the shadow government of Wyoming territory. They were all rich, all cattlemen, and they called the shots. They had the governor, Baker, uh, in uh, 92 in their pocket. Uh, the press was, uh, on, it favored them. So, uh, an interesting man, uh, an interesting firearm. Very interesting. On to weapon number two. Yes. Let me grab Let's it and set this one aside. Treating it with okay. gloves here. There you go. Thank you. This is a uh, rather uh, damaged Colt single action army revolver. Um, you may know that uh, the Colt single action army revolver was adopted by the U.S. Ordnance Department in 1873 and was the primary sidearm for uh, American soldiers up into the Spanish-American War days. So from 73 into the 1890s, it was the issue revolver. Custer's men were armed with them at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This particular revolver was owned by a man named Al Smith. And this is kind of a neat transition from stories of the cattle industry and William Sturgis to a gunfight that occurred in the hole in the wall west of KC in 1897. A guy named Bob Devine, who was foreman of the CY Ranch, and the CY Ranch was owned by Joseph Carey, governor, senator from Wyoming. So again, in the days of the open range, everybody just turned their cattle loose, and then once or twice a year, usually in the spring, they'd have a roundup to brand, the cattle, and then in the fall they do another roundup to select the animals that were going to market. And the hole in the wall uh, was infamous as a hideout for bandits and rustlers. So Devine and his group of 11 were determined to go into hole in the wall and see if there were any of their cattle in that location. He was accompanied by uh, two Montana stock detectives. One of them was Joe LaFours who is probably best known for extracting the confession from Tom Horn that he, in fact, had shot young Willie Nickel. <laughs> and Horn was uh, 
hung in uh, 1903 for that crime. So anyway, Lafors was with the group, and the group of 12 cattlemen encountered three riders coming the other direction. There was Al Smith and his brother Bob Smith, and brother-in-law Bob Smith, and a third party. Harsh words were exchanged, and there was a, evidently a history of bad blood between these two groups. So at some point, shots were fired, and uh, Bob Devine's horse was wounded, uh, but they, the cattlemen prevailed, killed one of the three, and the story is that Al Smith was carrying this revolver, and Joe LaFors, in his autobiography, claims that he was the person who shot this revolver out of Al Smith's hand. And it kind of matches because you can see this damaged area right here, which was consistent with a wound that Al Smith reported in his right hand. <laughs> so this is, again, in, in uh, I would say, poor condition because it evidently laid out for several seasons before it was eventually picked up and uh, eventually mm -hmm. donated to the Wyoming State Museum. It's interesting that these are pearl grips, mother of pearl grips, which would have been an option if you ordered the firearm from the factory. So this is in caliber 45, which was the same as the government issue revolvers, but a neat story. Yeah. And again, for me, it's like, wait a minute, the people who win the gunfights, like the people who win the wars, get to write the history? Divine claimed that Smith fired the first shots. And it's like, you got three guys and you're up against 12 armed cattlemen? Are you gonna fire the first shots? I guess we'll never know how that turned out, except we have this interesting story associated with this particular Colt single action army Very interesting. revolver. What's next? Great piece. Since we're on revolvers. <clears throat> it has a Cody. Um, background, right? Is that the, the gun you're going to Yes, here? yes. This is uh, another Colt single action army revolver. Well taken care of. Well taken care of. This may be one of <clears throat> my favorite firearms in the entire collection because this would have come from the factory with these hard rubber or gutta percha grips. The frame would have been color case hardened along with the hammer and the barrel and cylinder would have been blued. And if you look at this firearm, there's none of that original finish left. All the checkering is worn off the grips. So somebody carried this firearm every day and took very good care of it. Well used gun then. Well used. Again, one of my favorites, a gun with, with a story, whether we know the story or not. And initially we didn't know the story. We do now. Until my supervisor <laughs> pulled the grips off and etched under one of those grips was the name Earl Hayner, Cody, uh, Wyoming. So the reason there's a good story behind this firearm is that in March of uh, 1939, Earl Hayner was recruited to be on a posse to participate in a manhunt for a guy named Earl Durand. Well, who was Earl Durand? Earl Duran's family had a farm in the Powell area. Two of his older sisters were school teachers in Powell. Earl was 26 years old in 1939, and uh, he was probably born 100 years too late. He really was infatuated with the mountain man era and uh, the ability to live off the land. He uh, would spend every summer out in the mountains living off his uh, uh, handgun and his rifle, uh, living off the land. At one point, he took a horse and rode from the Cody area all the way into New Mexico. So he knew how to get along in the outback. One suspects that he might have been a little off, perhaps had claustrophobia, because when he wasn't in the woods, he lived in a tent behind his parents' house. <laughs> so anyway, in March of 1939, Earl was arrested for poaching elk. <clears throat> this was uh, about the time that the states were imposing licensing requirements in closed seasons. Is this in Teton County? Uh, Park County. Okay, in it Park County. Outside mm -hmm. of Cody. And uh, his two, his three accomplices were arrested, two teenage boys and the father of one of the boys. When they were stopped by the game warden, Earl jumped out of the vehicle and ran into the woods. He was subsequently arrested, brought to the jail in Cody, and when the jailer brought him his supper, he smacked the jailer with the milk bottle, 
took the jailer's firearm and instructed that jailer to drive him to the family farm, to the Durand family farm. And this is just speculation on my part, but I can sort of see the people say, uh, crazy old Earl Duran, we got to go pick him up. So two law enforcement officers went to the Duran farm and Earl shot and killed them both. So then it got serious. The sheriff of Park County, uh, Frank Blackburn, was out of town at the time. So the initial organization of a posse to participate in the manhunt was conducted by Millward Simpson who was attorney in Cody at the time and went on, of course, to be governor and senator from Wyoming. So the posse was organized. They involved the, Wyoming Nas or the Montana National Guard. They had an airplane equipped with dynamite bombs and tear gas bombs on the hunt for Earl Durand. And the owner of this revolver, uh, Earl Hayner, participated in that manhunt. So they located uh, Durand and two people, two individuals who had initially been turned down for a position on the posse uh, joined the group anyway. They had heard there was a substantial reward for capture, dead or alive, of Earl Durand. He had shot, two law, shot and killed two law enforcement officers. So they went charging up the hill towards Durand's hideout. He killed them both. So that's four. Four so far, okay. Four so far <clears throat> in 11 days. The fifth victim was a member of the posse who somehow managed, a young man in his 20s, who somehow managed to shoot himself in the leg with his own firearm. He were, they were way back in the woods when that happened. He had to be carried out. He was taken to the hospital. And over a, a period of several weeks, they amputated his leg three times, and he finally died of that injury. So now we're up to five. So while everybody is up on the mountain looking for Earl Durand, Earl Durand has taken a deputy sheriff's badge off one of the guys that he killed and is sitting down on the road waiting for a ride. So car comes along, they see a guy waiting with a badge on, they pick him up, not knowing that it's Earl Durand. He subsequently introduces himself and they are of course in a panic. So he makes them drive to Deaver where he picks up a package at the post office that contained <laughs> 300 rounds of 30-30 ammunition, which was the rifle that he carried. He, he just ordered it and had a yep. sitting there for him at the post office, yep. walks in, ordered it, and it's his order. was waiting for it to arrive. While he's being the subject of a manhunt. <laughs> yes, yes. So he went to the <clears throat> bank in Powell with the idea he was going to rob the bank for getaway money. And nobody understands, and there's been no logical explanation to me other than suicide by cop, he started shooting inside the bank. 30 to 40 rounds were discharged inside the bank. And what did that do? It alerted everybody in the area uh, that something was going on. And they assumed it was some gang of criminals because Earl Durand was supposed to be out of town up the mountain. So in the course of this uh, episode in the bank, he tied three bank employees together with the intent of using them as a human shield to get out and get to a vehicle. Well, uh, as they went out the door, the first person out the door was a 23-year-old teller who was shot and killed mm. by someone who assumed that he was the bank robber because they weren't expecting Earl Durand. They thought it was a, a robbery, just a, an ordinary robbery, if you will. So across the street in the filling station was a young man named Tipton Cox. He was 17 years old. He was basically playing hooky from high school at Powell, where he was on the football team. So he's across the street in this gas station, and as this unfolds, the owner of the gas station, for, again, whatever reason, hands him a rifle. So after the teller goes down, the other <clears throat> three employees are pulled down, and the young man, Tipton Cox, has a clear shot at Duran and shoots him with a Winchester rifle. Duran then calls, crawls back into the bank and commits suicide, shoots himself. So then we're up to seven. Seven, I don't look at this. Yep. So, wow. And, he, and again, this firearm was used by a member of the posse, Earl Hayner, outfitter and uh, Looking dude for rancher. Duran. Yeah. So I think it was interesting that Millward uh, especially sought out people who were familiar with the area, guides, outfitters, who knew the backcountry and could uh, participate in the pursuit of Earl Durand. What a sad story. Yeah, it's very. Let me set this one over here. Yep, I can have that for you. 
Okay, let's talk about the next rifle, which is a 1903 Springfield. You know, when I pulled this one out of the vault, I thought, oh, great, wow, we get to look at a, a modern rifle. And then I went, oh, wait, 1903? <laughs> what else was going on in 1903? A couple of brothers made the first heavier-than-air flight at Kitty Hawk. Uh, two guys named Harley and Davidson made their first motorcycle. So anyway, this is a model 1903 Springfield, chambered in 30 6 in its basic configuration, it is a five-shot bolt action. Uh, again, chambered in uh, 30 caliber, 30-06. And there's a little bit of an interesting story behind the reason that this rifle was developed. And it had to do with dissatisfaction of the issue rifle that was used in the Spanish-American War, which was a 30-40 Craig firing a heavy, round-nosed bullet. The, 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 Craig had to be loaded one cartridge at a time through a door in the side, and the American troops were basically outgunned by the Spanish who were using a Mauser rifle that fired a Spitzer or Spire point bullet at much higher velocities than was available in the 3040 Craig. So the search went on for a uh, military rifle to replace the 3040 Craig, and this 1903 Springfield was one of the designs that was uh, officially adopted. And interesting that, okay, uh, they, the Spanish had Mausers, let's make it look like a Mauser. And in fact, they made it so much like a Mauser that the United States government paid $200,000 in royalty to the Mauser company in Germany because they had used so many of the Mauser design components. Well, what's special about this rifle, and why is it, what's its Wyoming backstory? Let's <clears> turn it around so we can see the other side. And you'll note that there's this slot right here in the receiver. And that slot and other modifications to the rifle were made to incorporate something called the Pedersen device. Now again, this is a five-shot bolt-action rifle. And in World War I, it became pretty obvious that firearms with a higher rate of fire were needed uh, for the American military. So Pedersen, John Pedersen, who was a prolific firearms designer, uh, developed what came to be known as the Pedersen device. And that device replaced the bolt in the rifle, inserted into the bore, and came with a 40 round magazine. So that instead of a five shot bolt action. It became semi-automatic then. Semi-automatic, 40 rounds <clears throat> as fast as you can pull the trigger. And there was a contract for uh, 500,000 of these devices. But Pedersen had this incredible run of bad luck with his military or proposed military contracts because this came late in World War I, and by the time they were fully in production, there was only about 60,000 of them actually made, the war was over. This last rifle has a presidential connection, does it not? Yes, it does. So I'm gonna set this, I think I'll set it this way so we can see the ejection port. Okay, this is uh, an 1876 Winchester repeating rifle, lever action, it is the culmination of a series of lever action designs that started back with the Volcanic, which was a lever action firearm, very weak because the propellant was uh, contained in the base of the bullet. So it wasn't a very powerful weapon. The next was the Henry rifle, which was patented in 1860. It was a 15 shot repeater, again, um, firing a very fairly weak cartridge that was superseded by the Winchester 66, the Winchester uh, 1873, and eventually this rifle, which was designed to accommodate powerful rifle cartridges capable of dealing with either hostile adversaries or with the big game that was found on the American frontier, grizzly bears, <coughs> elk, mountain sheep, bison. Uh, this particular rifle is, chain, is uh, in caliber 50, which means the bore diameter is half an inch. Uh, it used 95 grains of black powder and a 300 grain bullet. Okay, so 
uh, Wyoming connection on this one. When I got to this rifle, I noted in the files that it said there was a name stamped under the butt plate, which was not uncommon. We saw it with the Hainer revolver, mm -hmm. scratched his name on the back side of the grips. In this case, stamped under the butt plate was Webb Hayes, Wyoming, 1879. So the staff person who helps me with genealogy, uh, I said, who's this Webb Hayes guy? See what you can find out, will you? And she came back in and she said, wow, he was the second son of President Rutherford B. Hayes. And we can very well document that he came to Wyoming to hunt and fish from 1879 until 1889, often in the company of the person he considered his godfather, General George Crook, whom of course we know from the Civil War and from the Indian campaigns. So how do we know that this really rifle really was belonged to Webb Hayes? Because anybody could have stamped that stuff in the butt, right? And again, archives uh, across the hall from the museum was very helpful. And we found a copy of the Annals of Wyoming from 1929, and it had an article in there saying, Reminiscences of Taylor Pinnock. Taylor Pinnock was a very early pioneer and settler in the Saratoga area, and he was the guide on this 1879 expedition that included General George Crook, Webb Hayes, and because Webb was the son of a sitting president, he had a cavalry escort from Fort Fred Steele. There are about 270 firearms in the permanent collection, and uh, I'm probably two-thirds of the way through. Evan, the Wyoming State Museum is just across the street from the Wyoming State Capitol. Correct. It's open uh, Monday through Saturday. Yes. So every day but Sunday, it's free, and there is just so much here for people who are interested in Wyoming history to see. Certainly firearms is, is part of that. Thank yes. you so much for joining oh, you're welcome. us I on enjoyed. Wyoming Chronicle. Very, very Thank enjoying. You. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.